Welcome to those of you who are with us right now. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Emily Cantrell and I'm the director at World Trade Center Seattle. For those of you wondering, what is World Trade Center Seattle? We are one of more than 300 World Trade Centers around the globe. We're owned by the Port of Seattle and managed by the Seattle-based company, uh, Columbia Hospitality. We are a member-based organization. We opened up in 1998, and it is our mission to bring leaders together through our social and educational programs. And for the last month or so, we've been doing that virtually during this time of physical distancing. So this is a part of our Navigating Business in Times of Crisis series. It's a three-part series, and right now we're focused on the adapting phase, you know, learning how to adapt to these changes that a lot of us had to do overnight with this COVID-19 crisis. So we'll spend a couple more weeks on this phase before moving on to recovering and then ending with looking ahead. So today we have Arden Kleiss with us, president of Kleiss Etiquette. Arden is an expert in the field of business etiquette, and she was actually scheduled to present last month at World Trade Center Seattle. It was a networking program, and we had to postpone that, so we're really excited to have her with us today. Arden is a speaker, trainer, and a coach, and she's also author of Spinach in Your Boss's Teeth, Essential Etiquette for Professional Success. And by the way, when we do reschedule the networking program with Arden, everyone will receive a copy of this book. We have them in hand. They are waiting to be handed out. And that program will also be extremely important as we navigate what is the new normal when it comes to networking, especially in a professional environment. So with that, I will hand things over to Arden. Great, thank you so much, Emily. It's a pleasure being here. and. Yes, man, big changes. The pandemic has changed everything about how we meet, how we connect, uh, how we do business, etc. So I'm sure, like me, you've been on a ton of virtual meetings. When I counted up how many I'd been on in the last week, it was 14. Um, some of those are me teaching manners classes to kids, service groups I belong to, client calls, et cetera, so, and trainings. Um, definitely, it is the new normal. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And, oops, um, let me just open this up. Uh, hold on. Go back to share my screen. And I'll jump in and say that, you know, everyone's video is turned off since this is a webinar and, uh, the chat function is on, so feel free to use that during this program. All right. So this, I thought this cartoon was appropriate. I'll give you a minute to look at it. It's pretty funny. My husband forwarded it to me and I said, oh, yes, that is the perfect one. And he said to me, Arden, please, please, please talk about some of these things. He too has been on many, many, many calls. <clears throat> so uh, yes, it is um, all sorts of behavior that we're seeing, both good, bad, crazy, et cetera. I remember being on one call with a um, group that I'm involved in and someone was cooking their breakfast. Um, on the camera and we heard the eggs being, we saw and heard the eggs being cracked and the refrigerator opening and closing. And we didn't get to eat the meal though. That was kind of a bummer. But uh, that and, uh, you know, just some crazy behavior. So because it is the new normal, it's hard to know what is and isn't appropriate. And that's, that's what today is all about. What is and isn't appropriate. So let me because uh, because someday I'm hoping we will get back to being together, but right now it is really all about the virtual meeting. So a few housekeeping items. Um, I know we don't have that issue of having to meet yourself because you are, um, but I like to show this for people who are new to Zoom. So um, if you're on a computer, this is how you mute yourself, and we will be doing using the chat function. We'll also have verbal questions at the end. So feel free to use chat when you're invited. And then um, I'm showing the smartphone functions for those who might be calling in on a smartphone. 
And then uh, lastly, we will be doing some raising of your hand. So you just click on participants and then raise hand and you'll have that function. So we are going to have you raise your hand, your virtual hand right now. So I want everyone to go ahead, click on participants, raise your virtual hand. And I should see everyone do that. Good, I see that going up. All right, so what I'm going to do is list some things that, keep your hand up, just keep it up. Um, I'm going to list some things that you may or may not be guilty of doing on a virtual meeting. And what um, I'm gonna say is in the last month, unless I give you a different time frame. So if you're guilty of any of these things in the last month, unless I specify a different amount of time, Put your hand down. We will see how many people still have their hand up at the end of my list. All right, so here is the list. Keep your hand up if you're not guilty of this, but put your hand down if you are. If you didn't mute yourself when you weren't talking in the last two meetings, put your hand down. Still have hands? So we lost one hand couple hands. All right. If you ate food while in the meeting, put your hand down. Lost a bunch. Okay. If you wore your pajamas, workout clothes, or something very skimpy in the meeting, put your hand down. Lost a couple people there. If your background, what people can see on camera, was messy or had anything controversial visible on camera. A few people on that one. Um, and finally, if your name showing under your picture was your employee ID, your spouse's name, or something other than your real name, put your hand down. We still have 12 people with their hands up. Congratulations. Big round of applause to you for that. That's wonderful. I'm gonna go through each of these. So starting with, if you didn't mute yourself. So you may put your hands down now. It's really important to mute yourself because it's not just what you're saying, it's also the, the noise in your environment. So a dog barking, the kids screaming, you know, even outside the house, you can hear sirens going by. Um, so it's really important that when you are not talking, you go ahead and mute yourself. So someone once recently tweeted that not muting your mic is the new reply all. I thought that was really well put. Um, so it really does pick up everything. And the other thing too, if, if unless it's a webinar, it's just a regular meeting, your Zoom, I know some of the others may do this, but Zoom will highlight your video when you speak or make noise. So even if you don't intend to say anything, but there's noise in your background, you get highlighted. So people, people now see that, that you have made some noise. All right, the next one. If you ate food while in the meeting, people do not want to see or hear you eating. And I know it's tempting, um, you, what you can do if you are not a participant who is expected to share a lot and you haven't had a chance to have your breakfast, go ahead and turn your camera off, your audio off, and quickly finish whatever it is that you need to finish. But normally, use this rule. If you wouldn't do it in an in-person meeting, don't do it virtually. Let's talk about beverages. So coffee, tea, and water are okay. And then there are some meetings that are happy hour type meetings. And that's appropriate to have a glass of wine or whatever your beverage of choice is. But it would look a little odd if you were having your glass of wine um, midday. Um, it's, it's again that rule, if you wouldn't do it normally in an in-person meeting, you wouldn't wanna do it in a virtual meeting. 
And then if you wore your pajamas, workout clothes, or anything very skimpy in the meeting. So we, it's really tempting to think, well, it's virtual. People can't really see much of me. You know, my pajamas are fine. I can't tell you how many bathrobes and pajamas I've seen. And while I really appreciate that people want to be comfortable, it immediately changes my sort of feeling about them. I, I, I also feel almost, almost embarrassed. Like I am entering their personal, personal world. And I don't really want that. I don't want to know their personal, that personal level of, of who they are. So again, um, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's online. So we are going to be just a little bit more casual, but make sure it's still professional. So something you would never wear to work, don't wear it virtually unless you're having a PJ party where everyone has opted in or, you know, it's a weekend casual, casual, you know, t-shirts are fine. Sweats are fine, but in a professional setting, stay professional, wear something that represents you well. I will also get in a little bit more on best practices on what looks best on camera. If your background was messy or had anything controversial visible on camera. So it's really um, easy to forget that the camera goes back pretty far and it can see everything. And, and you know, so interesting when I'm on meetings and I can see someone's background, I'm looking, what kind of books are they reading? Oh, wow, oh, look at that artwork. That's such lovely artwork. Or, you know, really? Oh, that poster? Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that person thought that way. <gasps> really? Wow, so messy. You know, so people are forming impressions of you based on your, what they see on camera. And it also can be really distracting if it's really messy. So make it nice. Um, I would have a lovely piece of art hanging behind me, but unfortunately the best light for me is right in front of a window which happens to face two doors, but it also means it's less distracting. But you can use virtual backgrounds, which I will get into a little bit later. So avoid um, making, making sure that, you want to make sure that nothing is in camera view that would reflect poorly on you, that may, might, people, may, might make people question your good judgment or question who you are. If your name showing under your picture was your employee ID, your spouse's name, or something other than your real name. So I have to tell you, as I was putting this presentation together, I needed a photo of a person with a name underneath them. Um, my husband agreed to be my model, and I said, make some funny faces. So this is my husband making a very funny face. And um, actually, the name was so slow and so small in the picture that I had to go ahead and just put a text box in there, but I've seen this. I've seen iPhone, my iPhone, I've seen employee IDs, I've seen spouses' names, I've seen all sorts of crazy things. And so it is really important to put your correct name in there. And um, if, you know, if it's a situation where it would be, usually it's proper to put your first and your last name. There might be situations where just your first name is fine, but make sure you do change that. And the way you do it is you hover over your picture or you click on you click on participants and then you hover up hover over your picture and it says more and you click on more and rename so you can rename yourself every time you sign into a zoom meeting you have that option to rename yourself so i know there's probably others on your list so this is your opportunity to go ahead and write in the chat box some other annoying things or knowing habits that you've witnessed in this virtual world we're in. So I'll give you a, a minute or so to do that. And then um, Emily, if you can help me with that, that would be great. Absolutely. And Arden, while we are waiting for people to write in some of the annoying habits that they've witnessed, we did have one question earlier. So maybe you can answer this in the meantime regarding muting. Uh -huh. When you mute yourself, is it for meetings and webinars or just webinars? It's both. So um, yes, it's both. And actually webinars, I think you are already muted, but meetings you're not unless the host has set it up that you can't, that you are muted, but that would be a little strange in a meeting. 
So yes, you do need to mute yourself when you're not talking. And I'll share a quick little tip. On a keyboard, if you have a keyboard, you're calling in with a laptop or a desktop computer that has a keyboard, to temporarily unmute yourself, you press the space bar. That space bar when you're typing and you have to put a space between sentences or words, um, that space bar will let you temporarily unmute yourself really quickly so you're not fumbling for the unmute when you wanna jump in and say something. As long as you're holding it down, it will keep you unmuted and then when you release it, you are muted again. So I find that really useful in meetings where I'm contributing a lot or I'm not saying a lot, but just kind of adding a little one or two thing here, pushing that um, space bar down really helps. Thank you, Arden. And it looks like we have quite a few responses now. Oh, good. What do we have? I forgot that you, um, you can <laughs> see this. Okay, so we have participants in a meeting getting up and moving around while their video is on, personal grooming, um, people slouching, people mm -hmm. talking over each other, mm -hmm. bad camera angles, you don't want to look up someone's nose, <laughs> video conferencing from bed. Oh, yes. Cell that phones so going bad. off, uh, people walking around in the background, and then the distracting custom backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are all really true. So I'm going to go through, uh, is that everything? And then also large meetings where uh, people might not have great reception, and so you can't hear them or see them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Brandon has a question that we can save until the end if you want about etiquette when a webinar presenter doesn't turn on their video. Okay. Yes, let's wait on that one. All right, so let's go through some of those. It looks like I have a lot of those lists, as those um, no-nos as well. So yes, moving around a lot. So the rule with that, two reasons we don't wanna move around. It is really distracting. It looks like you're bored. It looks like you're, you're doing other things. You're not really paying attention. And it just is distracting to other people. They're looking at you. Think if you were in a real meeting, an in-person meeting, would you be getting up, going out of the room, coming back on a regular basis? So here's the rule with it. If you need to get up and do something and you're not, actively participating or you're not required to actively participate in the meeting, turn your camera off before you get up and move and, um, and then come back and turn your camera back on. But if you're doing that repeatedly in a meeting, people are going to wonder, is this person really paying attention? Are they really engaged in this meeting? So try to get everything that you need before the meeting so you don't have to get up a bunch of times to do that. The other reason why we want to do that, why we turn our camera off, is it takes a lot of bandwidth. So every time you move around a bunch, it's using up bandwidth and it can crash your internet, it could crash the meeting internet. So those are some things to keep in mind. Stay focused, I heard you say um, having other devices on. So when I'm on a virtual call or a class or a training, my, my I'm looking at my, um, landline. It's put on do not disturb. I put my phone on mute. Uh, I've got two doors that I close so no one can come in. I've let my husband know that I'm in a virtual meeting and to not bother me. The dog is out <laughs> so um, I'm not distracted and I can stay present. So I really think using a headset will help you quite a bit. I use a headset every time I'm on a virtual meeting and it helps with sound clarity. So that addresses one of the, the problems someone mentioned about not being able to hear people in meetings or conference calls. Conference call, if you're all in the same room, it'd be a little strange to have a headset on, but if you're all calling in via Zoom or um, uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams or whatever the other application you're using, a headset will help you and it will help the people in the meeting. The other reason for doing it is there might be confidential information that's being shared in your meeting that you don't want spouses or other people in the house to hear. So that also protects your, uh, your company confidential information. 
be sure to let participants know if you're recording the meeting and let them know at the beginning just so they have a heads up so they're not picking their nose or something like that. <laughs> On that note, this is being recorded, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Let us, for, thank you for letting us know, Emily. Keep chat comments and conversations to a minimum. This is just like a side conversation. Do you hear? Did you hear what they said? Yeah. Did you catch it? Though? It's exactly the same thing as if you were in an in-person meeting. It's annoying. It's distracting. It keeps people from being able to pay attention. If you need to get clarification or you can add something to the meeting that maybe can be discussed later, use the chat function, but um, avoid the person to person and sending a lot of chat messages to the host or it just to everyone. Really try to minimize that. Any thoughts or questions at this point before I jump into some video meeting best practices? Anything I didn't address? No? Two people raising hands. And Emily, I can't see who those are, so if you want to take those up, that'd be great. Uh, Kevin, let's start with you. And you can now talk. Okay, okay thanks. Um, I'm a, a mediator, and one of the things that we, rec we require our participants to do is to not record what's being said in the meeting. Um, it's hard to enforce. Um, I mean, they'll, they may do it anyway, but for example, if your, your phone is sitting right there, you could turn the phone on and be recording the, uh, what's being said. And so I think that's a matter of, uh, it might just be a matter of ground rules at the beginning. I'm sorry, I came in a bit late, so maybe you've covered this already. Um, no, I didn't, Kevin. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, it's so true. I mean, that's, that's one of the downfalls to the virtual meetings is, you know, anything can be recorded. As you said, people can bring out their phone and record it. So um, you can't really prevent that, but definitely set some ground rules in the beginning. That's, that's very important. You can, in your global settings, set it up with Zoom so that no recording can take place um, or that participants can't record, but you can, yeah, you're right, you can't control if someone's recording with a phone. Paula, did you have a question? You are unmuted. You should be unmuted. Maybe you could write it in. Right. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think we can move on. Our okay, end. great. So here's some video meeting best practices for participants. And um, one of the things that, that this addresses, one of the no-nos that I, that I heard people say is where to put, put your, where to put your device. So it's true. We don't want to be looking up your nose. So we don't want it, you know, from way below. We don't want it too, like, you know, up here. Um, so the best position is where it's high enough that you can look right directly into the camera. I know that's difficult for some people because most desks are lower and you will be looking down, but there's props you can use. You can use books. You can use a file container box to get it up higher. Um, also think about the background. So you really want to avoid being in front of a window because then you, cr you become a shadow. People can't see you at all. So the best place for your laptop and where you're sitting or whatever device you're using is in front of a window. So if you're facing a window. So I am currently facing a window, although my monitor is, my desktop monitor is blocking it a little bit, but I am getting the light from that window and light facing your face is the best and most flattering and easiest to see. So the other thing that helps is to wear neutral and solid colored, I should say, clothes um, in case you have to get up and you haven't turned your camera off. Your pants may be seen. So do wear neutral solid colored um, clothing because it's easier to see. It's not distracting. Avoid stripes, black and white. So those are really difficult to, I mean, they're just more challenging to see. 
So here's a really great tip. Upload a professional headshot to your profile so that when you do turn your camera off, you have that profile, you have that um, picture. And that way it doesn't look so obvious when you leave and people can look at your lovely picture. And you do that at your account settings. So virtual backgrounds, um, because I'm in screen sharing right now, I won't be able to show you, but I will in a minute. And virtual backgrounds are, can be really fun as long as they're not really busy. Usually most, most Zoom accounts give you a certain number of, back, of virtual backgrounds. And what you do is you click on the little carrot next to video, and then you'll see virtual backgrounds, and then you'll see an option of different kinds of backgrounds. You can also upload your own pictures or logo, although I tried doing my logo and you can't really manipulate it at all. So it was so big, it just didn't work. But they can, they can be great if you really, really want to sit in bed <laughs> while you're on this call, use a virtual background so people can't see that you are in bed. I don't recommend being in bed, but if you have to be in bed, use a virtual background. And another good practice, and this is good etiquette, is to say goodbye when you leave the meeting. So that might be just by chat, just saying to everyone, um, I have to leave, great to see you all. Just a nice little way of kind of closing it out and not just ghosting the meeting. So for facilitator and host, best practices, here are a few things to keep in mind. Do establish protocol for asking or answering questions and speaking. So if, if you prefer people raising their virtual hand or their physical hand, let them know and then you'll go ahead and call on them. If there's gonna be time at the end for people to ask questions verbally, let them know. So whatever it is that you, your practices, let people know in the beginning. And as Kevin mentioned, let people know other things too about um, recording, about using the chat function. I usually turn the chat function to just with the host, but in certain meetings you wanna keep it so everyone can see what's being chatted about. It's, it just depends on what the nature of the meeting is and, and what you want to accomplish and how you want to accomplish it. But set all that protocol up in the beginning. Oh, so I kind of addressed this one. So for large or chatty groups, people who tend to use the chat function a lot, change it to host only or no one if you're finding that it's really being distracting and people aren't paying attention because they're spending so much time chatting back and forth, like having side conversations. So you can just change it and have no one chatting at all. So that leads us to questions. What questions do you have? And actually, I'm gonna just go ahead and get out for a moment. And that way I can, I'm gonna show you a couple of things that I just mentioned. So I'm gonna show you a background. I'm sure you've seen them, but for those of you who haven't, I'm gonna to go to San Francisco. There you go, I'm in San Francisco. Now- it's beautiful there, Arden. <laughs> I really wanna to go to the beach. I am now having a lovely time on the beach. So your virtual backgrounds can be a lot of fun, um, but don't spend the whole time in the meeting changing your virtual background because that can get really annoying. I am going to go back to no virtual background, so I am not being distracting. Right. So the first question, which we can revisit, was from Brandon. What do you do when a host forgets to turn on the video? Is it okay to, to give them a little nudge and ask them to turn it on? Absolutely. Yes. You know, people are still figuring all this technology out and, it, you know, especially as a host, there's a lot going on. So it's really easy to, to not notice that your video camera is not on. And absolutely, it's okay. Send a chat or verbally say, oh, it looks like your camera isn't on. Or we can't hear you. <laughs> all right. On telephone meetings or only attending by phone, should people announce themselves each time? That is from Carolyn. Each time you call in, I would assume. Um, I think it's, it's good etiquette to definitely identify yourself because when you're calling in, you're dialing in with a phone, you only see the phone number. So I, you know, people have no idea who you are. So do say, hi, it's Carolyn, I'm calling in. Just let them know. Mm -hmm. Any tips on how to avoid talking over each other? 
Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's really important, especially in virtual meetings, is to have a facilitator. That could be the host, the person who called the meeting. It could be someone who's appointed and have a little bit, have it be a little bit more intentional so that that person actually calls on people and says, or says, I'd love discussion right now. Um, let's hear from you know, the marketing team or let's hear, you know, something like that so that you are giving some structure to it and people aren't just jumping in and talking over each other. Okay. A hot topic right now, concerns with Zoom security. Has yes. that affected anything on your end, Arden? Well, thankfully I have not been Zoom bombed. However, there are several groups that I am um, a part of where that became a concern because the the meeting information, the login information was public. So um, there was a scramble. There were like three days of really intense meetings with people trying to figure out how to secure the meetings. So the things that we employed were um, having a waiting room. We, on, in one group, we actually stopped any uh, people allowing screen sharing. Um, we assign co-hosts and the co-hosts uh, are monitoring, watching people. The co-hosts can also, hosts and co-hosts can remove people. So it's being a lot more proactive, a lot more um, vigilant and aware that's really important. Using passwords is essential, especially if you're a large group and not broadcasting that password if you can avoid it. Sometimes you can't, but... Um, Using a waiting room is your best, your best tool. Excellent. Yeah, I think Zoom has already stepped up some of their security measures, and I know more are definitely on the way. The mm -hmm. passwords help for sure. Yeah. Um, another one from Carolyn. In a webinar, should participants send their chat to host and attendees or just host? It depends on what's being discussed. So, you know, think of sending an email reply all. Does everyone need to see that email or is it just directed to the host? If you feel that it's going to benefit everyone, then go ahead and use and click everyone. But if the host, particularly if it's an active host, there's some hosts that are really good about looking at the chats and saying, oh, I just got a message from Carol and say, asking about the blah, blah, blah. Um, so kind of ga gauge that and see if that if that is, person is the right person to do that with. If not, then do everyone. Okay. A question from Peter. What is the best way for an attendee to enter a meeting? And if you need more elaboration, I can unmute Peter. Yeah, maybe unmute Peter. Let's, right. let's talk about that. Peter, get ready to turn on your mic. I'm sort of like dehydrated. Um, hi, Emily. Yeah, a quick question was when I enter a meeting, what's the best way to say hi to everyone? Do I go around from corner to, from square to square? So, um, no, you don't have to do that. Uh, particularly if it's a big meeting. If it's just a few people, yes. You know, hi, Emily. Hi, Peter. How's it going? And the meeting hasn't started, of course. If the meeting has started, you wouldn't do that. You just come in silently and you know, when there's a break, apologize for being late. But um, if it's a really big group, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say hi to every single person. Just something like, hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Something like that. Okay, this next one is from Whitney. With so many back-to-back -back virtual meetings, we feel you, Whitney. What yes. is the polite way to inform a meeting facility? facilitator that they are not honoring the agenda and that you have to leave before you are able to present your report. Mm. Well, so the second part is what you would say. You wouldn't point out to someone that they're not following the agenda. Um, so basically you would say, you know, I'm so sorry. It looks like we're, um, the agenda's changed a little bit and I can't stay. I've got another meeting. So don't, don't point the finger, but but basically say, you know, I, I, I can't stay because the agenda's changed a little bit. Okay. And David is wondering how many people are on this meeting at this moment in time? We have 41. Uh, we, you have the option as a host to either show attendee count or not. It's turned off right now. Um, 
why can't you show all? I'm guessing you mean video, and because this is being run as a webinar, uh, the only time you see video is for people who are speaking, and that's an option that we selected because of the number of attendees, and also as Arden mentioned, you know, using all the bandwidth. And so for meetings, at least meetings that I'm facilitating or I'm part of, we do tend to turn on video, but for the webinar series, video is off for attendees and especially because the focus should be on the person presenting and i did just see that question about the whiteboard was that the latest one um oh i see it now i just opened yep how would you use the whiteboard feature in zoom i find it difficult to use that is from kevin mm -hmm. so i've been using it in my classes and um it, it can be challenging what I find the most useful is for using the text and just typing things. It's all, think of it as a real whiteboard in person. You know, you're capturing what people are saying. And it's, um, it's just another tool to use to um, engage different learners, the different learning styles. So I'll, I'll pull, pull up that whiteboard and as I'm asking people, what do you think about this? I'll write down what they're saying, usually in the text using the text uh, function. It's a lot harder on the draw function, but you could, you could do something fun with the, the draw function. Just depends on how much time you have and how much leeway you want to give your participants. Is there any Zoom training available to master this? <laughs> well, I'll, t I'll tell you this. When I, before all of the, the pandemic started and we became sheltered in place, I used Zoom occasionally. I knew how to get on. I knew how to chat. I knew how to turn my camera on and turn mute on and off. That was it. I had to get up to speed super, super fast. And I'll tell you what helped me. Zoom itself has so many articles on everything. So, you know, how do I use the chat function? How do I use the whiteboard? Anything you want, it's come up for me. And I've, I've learned so much. Um, breakout rooms, you know, all the different things that they offer. How do I set this setting? How do I change this? Ask Zoom, it's there. Do you want to, for people who have not used it, do you want to talk a little bit about the breakout rooms before our next question? Sure. So um, in a webinar, you can't do a breakout room, but breakout rooms are uh, a great way with a smaller group to put people, basically, it's like saying to, um, if you're in, doing an in-person training and you say, okay, I'm going to break you up into groups of, you know, whatever the number is, four or five or whatever the number is, and I want you to discuss this. So you're actually putting a group of people into a separate room, a separate virtual room, and, and having them discuss whatever, whatever it is you want them to discuss. So when you're doing that, um, you have to enable breakout rooms in your global settings for Zoom, and you um, click on breakout rooms. You can set it up in advance that you want certain people in certain breakout rooms, so you can determine who goes in which breakout room, or you can just let Zoom figure it out on itself. So once you hit breakout room, and you, have to, you also have to specify how many breakout rooms you want. So obviously you would look at how many participants you expect, and then how many people you want in each breakout room. And then hit that breakout room button, and people have to accept it, and then they're put into those breakout rooms based on either what you determined or what Zoom determines. It's really a cool tool. And then they get a warning when you say um, stop breakout room that they have to come back in a minute to the room uh, if they don't come back on their own. I will tell you, so I had a recent experience where we were put in a breakout rooms and we were not clear on the instructions about what we were supposed to do in the breakout room and uh -oh. we felt stranded. It was actually a terrible feeling and then we couldn't <coughs> communicate with the host until the oh. time was up. So uh, a friendly suggestion, just make sure instructions are very clear before sending people out into their own breakout room. Very, very clear. That's true. There is an option to ask the host a question when you're in a breakout room, but maybe it wasn't working or you didn't see it or wasn't an option then. They might but, yeah, it feels like you're a little um, abandoned, like, oh, yeah. my gosh. <laughs> exactly the feeling. And, and the other thing I will add to that is the host can go into, you can go into the breakout rooms and check in on people and just, hey, how's it going? 
and then come back out. It takes a little bit of time. It's not instant. You know, it has to, and then you're there. That's pretty cool. All right, Michael has a question. How do you navigate when either you or the presenter are having connectivity issues and the voice is glitchy? Mm. So it's hard when it's you because, you know, one thing that helps if, if you're breaking up a lot is to turn your video off and make it clear that's why you're doing it. Because again, as I said, your video uses a lot of bandwidth and sometimes that will affect the connection and your voice. So just say, looks like my, band, my bandwidth is low. Um, my internet's not, not working really well. I'm gonna turn my video off. And usually that helps a lot. And then if the same thing is true for another person, just make a nice suggestion. You could even just do it in chat and just say, we're having a hard, well, it's okay to say to ever, say out loud, we're having a hard time hearing you. You keep breaking up. Um, maybe turn your, your camera off or send that in chat if they're having a hard time even hearing you. Okay, uh, Kevin is asking how documents are managed in Zoom. In particular, he's needing to get some signatures virtually for an agreement. In Zoom? I'm thinking that might be something, Kevin, that you want to use perhaps DocuSign? Yeah, I was just gonna say, use DocuSign. It has nothing to do with Zoom, but DocuSign is, is such a great tool. And it just, it, it shows you where to sign. You sign for, um, online and then it sends it to your, your person, whoever needs to sign it, and it'll let you know when they've signed it. So it just makes life so much easier. And especially since this is um, for mediation, yeah, I think DocuSign, it, it's probably better for legal purposes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think we've tackled all the, oh, let's see. Nope, we've addressed that one. Does anyone else have any questions about virtual meeting etiquette? I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen again just so we can get that last bit. And But I am, I'm still here for questions. Arden, I have a question. Yes. What do you do when someone has a virtual background on, but I've noticed that sometimes people lose parts of their head <laughs> or shoulders. And I know it matters what kind of uh, actual physical background you have before applying the virtual background, but what do you do in that instance? So again, I would just let them know because a lot of times people aren't noticing these things, especially if you're in a meeting, a virtual meeting, and you're a square that's this big and you've set it for gallery view. And so you can't see really yourself very well. Um, just let them know, yeah. And, and does everyone know, I'm, I mean, I guess I'll just put it out there, that you can change between gallery view and speaker view. That is hugely helpful. If there's a lot of people, what I find if I have it in gallery view, so um, I'll show you when I get out of the slide, but um, it's at the upper right hand corner of your screen. You're not gonna be able to do it on this because it's a webinar, but um, if you change it from gallery view to speaker view, you just see the one person who's speaking at a time and then maybe a couple of people on the side. Um, I find it really distracting if I'm on gallery view because I'm seeing all these faces and they're all moving a little bit and I'm like, where do I look? And I can't concentrate. So I put it on speaker view. Excellent. And we do have a couple more questions coming in, Arden. Uh -huh. A great question from Janice. Start meetings on time or allow some number of minutes for everyone to get online? So I'm a real stickler for starting on time and um, whether it's virtual or in person. And what we, we, we basically reinforce it's okay to be late if you wait. So people start to say, oh, um, Janice will always wait. She always waits till I get there or until everyone gets there. So it's okay that I'm late. But if you start on time and people come in and the meeting's con being conducted, they're, all gonna, they're gonna get the message pretty quickly. Oh, she's really punctual. And it's hard at first because you might have one person there, maybe two, but just get going and then let them join in. And um, the other thing you can do is let people know I am really punctual. I start right on time. So if you're not able to join us right away, just, you know, come into the meeting quietly and, and you'll catch up, something like that. 
And then Whitney says, on some recent meetings, there are attendees I do not know and would like to connect with after. What is the best way to connect? Chat with them during the meeting or request their information from the host after? Um, so both of those are fine. And if, if chat, the chat function allows you to chat with someone privately, then that's fine. Try to do it before too close to the end of the meeting because they may miss it. Um, otherwise, ask the host if you can. Yes, both are fine. And it looks like that is it for now for questions. All right. Well, it's really been fun being here and hearing your wonderful questions. And I invite you to connect with me on my newsletter, my e newsletter. Uh, you can text the word manners to the number 22828 or go to my website at kleisetiquette.com. And Emily did mention my book, Spinach in Your Boss's Teeth. It's available on Amazon. It's got chapters on everything from professional dress to dining etiquette to meeting etiquette social media etiquette, email, phone, you name it. All right, and I'm just making sure that they're... Yes, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy to stay as long as you need me. Okay, looks like that's it for now. So Arden, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Thank you everyone for attending and for your questions. Uh, one question that just came <laughs> in, how applaud. do you applaud? Yeah, in a webinar, you can't do it, but in normally you can in a meeting because they have the little um, reaction. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I feel the love. I feel the love. Thank you. <laughs> well, we will be sending out a survey after this along with the recording of the program, and we'll include the tips that Arden has covered. So please do take a minute to respond to that. Uh, we made it short and easy to answer, but we really do appreciate every single response that comes in. Our next program is called Performing as a Virtual Organization, and this is next Tuesday. Uh, we're joined by three thought leaders in this area who authored uh, three stages to a virtual workforce. And the speakers are from New York, Germany, and Australia. That is the fun part about doing programs virtually is you can have global speakers and a global reach. So head to wtcseattle.com for more information on that. And one last question, what about the use of emojis, Arden? In email, I'm assuming. Well, I know also in Zoom, you can do the little thumbs up and... Oh, the reactions. I think they're fine as long as you're not overdoing it. Yeah, they're fine. And I think actually it can be really fun to let people know, nice job, the hand clap or thumbs up. I think they're both just fine. But if you're doing them constantly, it'll get distracting. Just like if you had a bunch of emojis in the email, people are like, oh, stop already. <laughs> All right. Well, if anyone has any questions, feel free to respond to the email that we send out later today. In the meantime, take care, stay safe, stay healthy. Take care, Thank everyone. You Thank you for being here. Bye. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Arden.